Good morning. I'm Victoria Budson, the Executive Director here at the Women in Public Policy Program. We wanted to welcome you today. And we have our first seminar of the spring semester looking at negotiating a better future. And we have two presenters today, Kathleen McGinn and Naja uh, Nava Ashra, who are both here from Harvard Business School. And they're going to be sharing with us both field experiments as well as information that they've looked at from data-driven experiments in labs, helping us better understand relational aspects and how women negotiate and the outcomes, with a particular emphasis today on the work which is being done in Zambia and how relational experiences impact women's health and other outcomes. This is just one of the many field experiments which NAVA is working on within Zambia. Kathleen's work has focused both with service-providing firms here in the United States, self-employed women in India, and then, of course, the work in Zambia. She's been a frequent contributor to the WAP seminar and is one of the key faculty members who helps us as we look at identifying replicable interventions in the areas of economic opportunity, political participation, education, and health. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Kathleen to share her work. Nava and I will be presenting the talk today, but we want to um, tell you that very much of the credit for today's talk is due to our co-author Corinne Lowe, who can't be with us today, and to Kate Otto, who, where's Kate? In the back, who has um, been working with us on this project and who has been so instrumental in getting all of the work done. And um, perhaps most importantly, we want to thank um, the coaches who were in Zambia in our third pilot right now um, trying to put this into play. So none of those people could be here, but we could not possibly be talking about this if they weren't all um, involved in this work. So let me give you a little bit of the genesis of this work um, because it comes from two different paths to ask um, one question. So I had been involved in Kenya with some um, work with youth there. And through that, um, someone had called me about negotiating um, as a skill that girls could learn to help them um, protect themselves against HIV and sexually transmitted diseases. Um, the call came from Swaziland. Swaziland has the highest rate of um, HIV in the world. It's about 26%. Um, and I said that I'd be interested, but only if we could set it up as a field experiment, which was um, a quite gutsy thing for me to say since I've never done a field experiment. <laughs> and um, so as soon as that conversation ended, I called Nava, who is um, a field experiment um, uh, expert, and said, you know, let's talk about this. And she said, um, she had a co-author that she'd been working with, Corinne Lowe, who's a um, doctoral student at Columbia School, at Columbia School of Business. And um, they had been thinking about negotiation as a way to affect girls' um, school, staying in school. So the dropout rates for girls are different than they are for boys. And so we, we looked at the Swaziland um, possibility. We looked at working with the group that I've been working with in Kenya. And it became pretty clear that because NAVA already has um, a whole apparatus on the ground in Zambia, that Zambia would be the right place to test this. And hopefully, um, if we um, find positive results, we can then um, work with these other groups to actually implement it in other places as well. So, so that's the genesis of this study. Um, in some ways, the, um, the negotiation started with even thinking about how to negotiate with one another to get into this place. So it's been an incredibly rewarding path to get us to where we are. We are not done. So what, what we're hoping for from all of you today is that as we go through um, you think about what we might do better. So we are currently in what we hoped to be our final pilot. Um, and we would start the um, full study in May. We have many questions about whether what we're doing is um, the best we can absolutely do. So um, we're going to keep the talk relatively short and then open it up and hopefully get your ideas about what we might do to improve the study. Zambia, like many of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, has relatively high HIV rates. Um, but of interest for us for this study is the difference between um, HIV rates for men and for women. So um, what you see it, here is the uh, rural Zambia. Here's urban Zambia. 
the solid line is women and the dotted line is men. And what you see is that the rate of uptake of HIV is much, much steeper for women than it is for men, and it's true for urban as, rel as well as rural. It drops off um, for women much more steeply than it drops off for men. But at the youth stage, men are, um, well, what's happening here is that essentially girls are engaged in sex with older men. Um, so, so protecting the girls, in essence, would protect the whole population. So the, qu so the question is, yeah? Do you know why the trend reverses? Women tend to be in more monogamous relationships. Um, that doesn't absolutely protect them. Um, but if you look at this rate, you're already at 30%. So um, at, at some point, everyone who's out there in sort of, um, multi-sex relationships or multi-partner relationships is already positive. Um, this is changing somewhat with antiretroviral drugs. Um, you can see that this is 2003, but nonetheless, the population that we're concerned with is the um, relatively young girls, the teenage girls who are um, involved in early sexual relations. The same thing, or a similar picture comes out when you look at dropout rates. So for Zambian students, school is free until they're done with roughly the equivalent of seventh grade. Um, once you get into eighth grade and beyond, there's both fees and testing. And so you have, to, you have to actively do something to stay in school after seventh grade. And what you see is much, much steeper dropout rates for girls than for boys, although you get this um, sort of jagged behavior around the um, introduction of tests and, drop and, tests and fees. Um, Girls drop out for different reasons than boys do. Girls are largely dropping out because they're expected to um, help at home or because they get pregnant and they end up getting married. And so, again, like with HIV, if you can protect the girls at an early stage, um, you can have a huge difference in their life expectancies as well as improving the life of men that they're involved with. So if you think about the consequences of um, dropping out of school, you have um, having children, which is for many reason, or for many girls, the reason they drop out of school, uh, earlier marriage, and less education, lower human capital, um, and these have their own um, effects. So early childbearing. So the younger you are, the more likely you are to die when you have a child, and the less he healthy your child is likely to be. Um, early marriage, because these um, because these girls are involved um, with older men when they get married, um, men who have multiple sex partners, you have higher rates of HIV. Um, early marriage means that you have unequal, in essence, une unequal market power, so unequal bargaining power in the marriage if a young girl marries an older man. Um, and low human capital means fewer options overall. So if you look, if you think about dropping out of school as just education, what you're missing is all of the other implications for girls that drop out of school. Uh, the response to both of these problems, by and large, has been to provide information. So the response, um, there are policies throughout Sub-Saharan Africa to deal positively and actively with um, HIV. They involve mostly the transmission of education. Education around HIV, around behavioral changes that you can make to avoid HIV. Education around gender norms. And education around reducing violence against women. Um, this, they also provide care, testing, and counseling. But of course, all of those things um, happen after you contact HIV. And the same thing is true for education. So there's quite a bit of work done to try to help children understand the benefits of staying in school. And so in some ways, information is expected to change this behavior. And it can. So there have been studies that show that the conveyance of information changes behavior. And all of us, all of us engaged in the academic endeavor 
um, hope that this is true, right? That's why we do what we do. We expect that if we teach people, they're going to go out and do something differently than they would have done it before we teach them. And it turns out that it's true in some populations around um, sexual behavior and staying in school as well. So one of the issues with girls contacting HIV is that if you sleep with older men, older men have had more partners, more partners increases your chances of getting sexually transmitted diseases. So conveying some education about that actually seems to change some behavior. Um, but the information has to be very, very specific. So you can see that what's been conveyed here is one specific piece of information. More general information tends not to be as helpful. Um, and one of the things that um, we've learned through talking with the people in the Ministry of Education in Zambia is that the education in the schools around HIV is very general. Um, it's, age, it's age appropriate and it starts very young, which is a positive, but there's very, very little about anything specific the girls or boys can do to make sure that they um, protect themselves from sexually transmitted diseases. Largely, it's about, um, it's about abstinence once they actually start talking about sex. Um, there does appear to be some evidence that um, cash transfers or other resources like uniforms make a difference in terms of these sorts of behaviors. But if you think about what you're trying to change, you're not trying to change a one-shot behavior. So if the question is, am I going to stay in school in eighth grade? Well, if you give me the funding to stay in school in eighth grade, that increases the likelihood I'm going to stay in school in eighth grade. But what about ninth grade and tenth grade and eleventh grade and twelfth grade? And if we had sufficient funds, it would be wonderful to make it so that the schools were absolutely free for everyone and absolutely high quality, but we don't have that figured out in the U.S. and we're not going to have that figured out very soon in Zambia. So if you think about cash transfers, cash transfers can help a lot when you're talking about a one-time, one-change behavior. But if you're talking about trying to change the um, relationship behavior of young girls, it's hard to think about how cash transfer is going to work there. Information, on the other hand, is very, very powerful. So all of us um, know of things that we've done differently because we've learned something. But information, uh, the use of information in changing behavior assumes a couple things. First of all, it assumes, by and large, that I can change my behavior, that the behavior in so somehow is independent, that my decisions are things that I make, that my behavior is something that I control. And what this ignores is the large um, set of behaviors that everyone engages in that are interdependent. So when I decide whether I want to take a new job or not, that's something that I have to discuss with my family. I can't just walk into a new job. So as soon as I have to go home and talk about should I take this job, all of the knowledge I have about how this job might be better or worse for me somehow has to, has to be conveyed to the other side and used in a negotiation with the other side. So the conveyance of information, the assumption here is that if we give girls information about um, how to make behavior changes around staying in school, how to make behavior changes around um, sexual behavior, the costs of, some of, of doing some of these things, the benefits of staying in school, the benefits of staying disease free, the benefits of not engaging until sex later. The question is, is this an independent decision or choice that the girls make? And there's plenty of evidence that it's not. Um, very little intimate behavior with a partner is an individual choice. And even staying in school, you have to negotiate with your parents for the money. You have to negotiate with your siblings so that they're doing stuff at home as well as you. You have to negotiate with your teachers. You have to be able to negotiate with the life around you to make sure that you can show up at school. So this assumption that underlies implicitly, it's never made explicit, the assumption that underlies the conveyance of information as a solution for these behaviors um, isn't met here. Uh, the WHO in 2009 did name negotiation as one of the skills that needs to be conveyed to girls and women to protect them from HIV. 
um, in sub-Saharan Africa. So women may face barriers to HIV AIDS education, testing, and treatment. So this is what the policy offers due to their lack of access to and control over resources, child care responsibilities, restricted mobility, and limited decision-making power. So access to and control over resources demands some negotiation to have access and some control. Child care responsibilities demands some negotiation to spread that responsibility across the household. And restricted mobility and limited decision making, again, requires some negotiation to open those up and get the woman as part of the decision making body in the household. And so this is where we started moving. What we're hoping is that holding resources constant there's great variation in how well individuals can take advantage of the information that's provided to them. And our working hypothesis is that if you offer skills and relationships, if you offer negotiation training, then they'll be able to use this information in ways that allow them to actually change their own behavior. In the process, they'll be changing other people's behavior as well. Um, but the outcome that we're hoping for is changing their own behavior. So the questions we asked with this study are two fundamental questions. Um, in an environment that lacks resources and where the girls lack power, is information sufficient to create measurable impact? And given information, can negotiation skills help the girls change their behavior? Change their behavior in terms of HIV transmission and in terms of education. One of the things that NAVA will be talking about that we would love your help with is what the indicators of this might be. So we have a study in place and if we could perfectly track all of the girls in the study over the next 10 years, we could have some information about this. Um, but we would love to have some indicators in the shorter run that these things are likely to be changing. So NAVA will be talking about that. So our hope is that negotiation skills provide a process for using information within a relationship and that they change the balance of power so that the girls feel more powerful. Now there are, oops, sorry. There are some programs around just empowerment, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but we think that negotiation is quite different than simply talking about girls' empowerment. Um, so there's quite a bit of literature, including some um, of Hannah's and mine, that assumes um, that negotiation helps women um, get a better allocation of resources. I say assumes because none of this work is empirical work. Um, the empirical work has um, little and to the extent that there are findings, mixed findings. So there is little support for the assumption that negotiation training can have big effects on life changes. This isn't because um, studies have studied it and found that it doesn't. It's largely because studies don't study it. So research that looks at the effect of negotiation training tends to look at very immediate, short term, um, and very, very specific types of behavior. So if we train you in negotiation skills this week, next week, will you claim more value in a negotiation that's very much like this week's negotiation? Um, that even has shown some mixed results, but um, the study that Corinna Nava and I are engaged in asks a much uh, sort of stronger question of negotiation and that is, can it actually change long-term behaviors when the negotiation itself isn't defined? So part of what we're trying to do with the girls is help them to think about situations as ones in which they might be able to negotiate. So to feel themselves as having some power to actually change the interaction itself and therefore change the outcome of the interaction. Yep. Kathleen, um, this actually was a question for the previous slide, so I'm sorry if I go back. Oh, sorry. Um, you might not actually have to answer that. It's a more generic question, mm -hmm. and that is the empowerment question. Yeah. Um, because we've actually been struggling with the question of how Oops. to measure empowerment. Oops. And you said, yeah, this is different from empowerment. Yeah. And uh, often empowerment, I think, is measured on the dependent variable, economic yeah. resources or control over yeah. things. But I, I'm struggling yeah. with, with that whole question of, we're always talking about you know, empowering women, but what yeah. does this really mean? 
Yeah, so Nava can talk more about this, but one of the issues with empowerment without um, relational skills is that it's dangerous for these girls. Mm -hmm. so, so you can imagine a situation where you truly don't have the power and it's not being granted to you, and you're involved in, um, imagine some kind of training program that says, you know, girl power, girl power, girl power, which we do talk about in the, in the um, training. And then you go out and you try to establish this girl power. Um, you try, in essence, to be powerful in a situation where you don't have the skills to do so. Um, so it may be that empowerment of girls in situations where girls are granted more power in the world but they're just not taking it would have a very um, different likelihood of success. But the girls that we're dealing with are girls that are in situations where the world's not granting them power. So simply to um, feel powerful and demand it without the tools to um, create acquiescence on the part of the other is gonna be problematic and dangerous for the girls. Do you wanna to add to that? Sure. I think, so th there's two things. One thing, just to, just to say on that part, we actually we had to spend two and a half years really just developing the curriculum for this because it was so dangerous to be able to, you know, it was really scary that you could say in this environment, if women, if girls were to sort of take that power, it would actually backfire tremendously. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to do something that was really culturally sensitive. The other side is there is one, one area, level in which this is very related, which is I think negotiation at its core is about seeing constraints and, and, and creating creative solutions. So in other words, you're not feeling as constrained as you were before. And I think a lot of feeling disempowered is feeling so utterly constrained by your environment that you can barely think how to get out of it. You know, and we know all the effects of cognitive stress and things that can occur when you feel that way. Something that has has happened, I guess, we, we see through the pilots, and we'll talk more about this in the second half, is that the girls are seeing that they are not as constrained as they, they thought they were. And that is, in some sense, empowerment, but it Absolutely. happens through being able to recognize where the constraints are and where they aren't and, and create creative solutions. So the ultimate effect is empowerment, but it doesn't come through feeling more power, like being told you're more powerful in a way. Right. I mean, yeah. it all yeah. seems like the way you're defining it, and I'm going to use the nego negotiation language, is not so much as distributive. No, right. it's, it's right. very right. 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 You're, you're right. talking much more about seeing exactly. new opportunities and logic right. decided to high. Right. Therefore, might not lead to kind of backlash such as dom domestic violence. And yeah, and right. I mean, I think that's absolutely critical in this case because right. they're so ultimately quite powerless. You know, this is a kind of yeah. negotiation where you don't have a lot of power compared to the people who are you're negotiating with, so yeah. you have to work on shared interests. You know. Yeah. And now we'll talk more about the curriculum in a little while, but um, Iris has hit on something that it, it actually took us years to get to. Um, and so when we started, we did have um, a much, much more of a blend of distributive and integrative negotiations. Um, get the market bargaining. Yes, you know? exactly. We were sort of, we were, we were thinking about teaching negotiation in the same way that we teach it here. Not, not the same cases and things, but in essence with the same um, mental model of what it is um, you needed to know to be a good negotiator. Um, and, and Nava will talk a lot about how, how we've moved from there. Um, we started with um, Jared Curhan's program for, for young negotiators, um, which came out of the um, uh, PON here at Harvard, and it didn't take very long to learn that we couldn't use that model. Um, and, and again, Neville will talk more about that. But I, I did, just before we came, take out a sli slide on empowerment. I'll put it back in. <laughs> <laughs> but good. we're going to measure the same types of things, like self-efficacy and, you know, bargaining power in the household, things like that. It yeah. comes at it a bit differently. Um, interestingly, the research on negotiation affecting HIV shows much better potential than the research on negotiation itself in terms of uh, other kinds of outcome variables. So um, when you look at the meta-analysis of HIV interventions, and there's one very good study of this, um, the most effective are the ones that combine the information with the behavioral skills training. Now, in some of these cases, the behavioral skills training is essentially about condom use. But if you go into the studies, those that provide behavioral skills training that is relational skills training have um, an increased um, efficacy in HIV intervention. 
Um, there are some studies that look at uh, youth. This is, this is the, the only one we saw that got um, positive effects. But it does look as if, if you, again, use communication, not just information. So this is training about how to communicate. Um, it looks like that affects um, sexual behavior a year later, which is, this is a wonderfully time-lagged, you don't get these kind of time-lagged um, outcome variables. So, and again, the nice thing about this study that led us to think that there was some promise in this was that by itself, information and providing condoms did not change behavior. But if you add the communication training, um, it does change that behavior. They did some attitude training as well, and Nava will talk. There is some attitude training in what we're doing. So we ended up with a, um, a three treatment design. So if you think about providing negotiation training to the girls, you have to say, what is it um, that we're providing? How do we know it's about negotiation training? So one of the things that we're providing is, in essence, some safe time, some time away with a bunch of other girls. Mm -hmm. So the control treatment, what we think about in the control treatment, is actually a sort of social capital treatment. And that is that the girls go after school they spend some time together, they get a sandwich. Um, the other thing that is provided in the negotiation training is we are providing them information about HIV, about sexual behavior, about the benefits of staying in school. So we have an information only treatment. We did think when we started, we thought about, well, they're already giving <coughs> education in the schools, let's just add the negotiation training. Um, but it didn't make sense to think that if we were gonna spend a bunch of time with girls and give them really um, thoughtful, in-depth information um, that had much more specific skills training that we could compare that to what, was getting, what they were getting in the schools. And so this is our basic treatment, and now Nava will tell you all the details. So they're in exactly that. They're in eighth grade. Um, the age span in school there is much broader than it is here. So they're actually 13 to 17. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are these the girls that they are still allowed to go to school for free, or is this the point where girls are actively deciding to be in school? Actively deciding to be in school. And is that you have a slightly different cohort than yeah. typical? Yeah, so yes. So Nava will talk some about that. There was a big choice about whether to go into seventh grade or eighth grade. Um, and we, ha we had to balance out um, intervention at an early point, at a point where we could really um, make a difference with um, the maturity to deal with the information we wanted to convey. And so we ended up at eighth grade. That might be helpful to think about. And the empowerment slide is in here, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, actually. Okay. There's this, but maybe oh, there. Oh. We'll, um, but anyway, the, the, this, this, uh, there's been a lot of teaching negotiation to, to youth. The, I, I just wanted to draw our attention to these couple quotes, which I thought were really interesting. This was from our original focus groups. And um, these three, I don't have words because we're not supposed to talk back to adults. Sometimes you want to insult them, but you can't. You can feel like a chest in your, in your fist, like in your chest where you want to say something and can't. The bad feelings just stay in you. Us girls, we usually just go along. When someone wants to do something, at first you think about it, but then you just join. Those represent the two main ways we had seen for girls to deal with the deep frustration when they are faced with constraints that they feel they, they, they are powerless against. So it's either acting out, which they get tremendous backlash for, and you know you see that here in the, in the quote, maybe she could be possessed by a demon, which is the way people talk about it. If a girl talks out in Zambia, that's how it's considered, um, or swallowing it. Um, and so having a, a middle language that can actually communicate what they, what they want to achieve and be able to rationally think through it, um, I, I, we, we sort of started to discover could be incredibly powerful. Uh, and so the overall idea here was, was to sort of take the, the primary schools in, in Lusaka, Zambia, um, working with a partner that we've been um, 
we, we started working with about a year ago, which is a local NGO, it's the Anti-AIDS um, Teachers Association of Zambia. Turns out that the founder and president of that just got um, appointed the HIV AIDS coordinator for the Ministry of Education, so now he's very excited about bringing this into the Ministry of Education, which is, which is wonderful. They've been a wonderful partner for us. Um, and, you know, 1,000 to 3,000 eighth grade girls randomized um, within the schools for these three treatments that, that uh, Kathleen talked about. So as, as she mentioned, you know, the difficulty was we wanted to be able to have girls that have enough maturity that they can understand these concepts but are not so far removed from the process that it's too late. And um, Kathleen spoke a bit about what, what motivated me to, to get involved in this. It was really, you know, I'd been working there for a while and saw that you see these girls that are, you know, eight, nine, sometimes 10, they have such fire in their eyes. And then, you know, you see girls, even the ones who've stayed in school, like 14, 15, 16, all the fire's gone out. So just trying to understand what happens in that period was really important. And, and you know, along with all the changes that happen, there are, you know, big exams that you have to take, that you have to study for, and tuition fees that come in. There's initiation ceremonies that these girls go to, and in there they're told, okay, now your role is going to change in society. So part of our thing was how could we, should we do this before the initiation ceremonies, or, you know? And, and, and so how, you know, through the pilots we decided to settle on grade eight girls that really have that, that right balance. Um, and is grade eight before or after that? So it depends on the girl often, but it's, it, it looks like it's a bit before. Okay. So we're, we're sort of safe on that dimension. The other thing is even if it's a bit after for some of the girls, because it sort of depends on when each of them reach um, their menstruation, mm -hmm. um, even for some of them who are after, at least to have a place to talk about some of this stuff and to be faced with something different, like okay, that's not, that doesn't have to be my role in society, can be, can be powerful. Are you going to talk more about the randomization and how you did Yeah, that? yeah. So, um, so basically, <clears throat> um, this, is, and, and by the way, we've only done pilots and I'll tell you about those, so this is not, and all of it's up for grabs, the whole experimental design, any, any comments you have are very, very welcome. Um, so getting parental consent and, and, and doing a baseline survey on both the, the parents, the other siblings, and the, and the kids, the girls themselves, and then a public lottery within, each, within the school. So in other words, all, we'll say this is a program, an after-school program for grade eight girls, and there's you know, lots of programs going on in the region, so it's not a big deal. Okay, there's an after-school program, but there's gonna be some different types of things. All of you will get a sandwich, all of you will get time to play games, et cetera. There's gonna be some different groups. And then there's, so then there's a public lottery that the girls um, uh, will be assigned to the different groups. And then there'll be the intervention. And then there's going to be, um, which is again, these, these six days, essentially, and I'll go through it in detail, of just the sort of social capital, the information, and then the negotiation. And then three rounds of follow-up. So there's an immediate exit survey, and then we're going to be continually actually um, getting data. I'll talk more about the data sources from the school, um, institutional data on participation rates, tuition fee payments, uh, exam scores, et cetera. And then um, a follow-up survey, and then a long-term follow-up. Yeah. Sorry, uh, why did you decide to do a public lottery uh, versus doing something that would be a little bit more closed, uh, closed doors? Would it be actually open to everyone? Because would that not influence the way the girls uh, perceived going into each group? Yeah, the big thing was what we needed to, to be sure of is that the girls didn't feel that they were getting something different because of some inner feature of themselves. Because all that would do is essentially exacerbate whatever feelings of insecurity they may already have. And so if, for example, they found out, it's true that it would be less likely then, but you know, we know that they'll talk and it's all grade eight girls. So they'll say, what are you learning? Why wasn't I learning that? Why was I put in a different group? And particularly because when we discovered it through one of the pilots, which you know, took us a while to discover because they weren't telling us this, because they basically, we said, you know, can you give us a similar group of, of grade seven, grade eight girls? And they gave us one in the morning and one in the afternoon and they refused to tell us that actually the ones in the afternoon were, um, had, had failed their entrance exams and were getting remedial help. So it was like a, a remedial group, which would have been fine, but it obviously screwed up the randomization for us in the pilot. But they didn't want to tell us because they didn't want us to be treating them any differently. But what do the girls themselves think? They realize they're in a different group. And so we just wanted to make sure, given that there is a precedent for being in a different group because you're remedial, we just wanted to make sure that that's not what they were thinking. Yeah. Bias just because of the schoolgirls that can actually participate um, versus the ones that who have to go home after school and maybe take care of their little brothers yeah. and sisters or work 
to go to work or something oh, yeah. like that. And so these these school girls are um, probably already more empowered than definitely. The others. No, I mean that, and that's a that's a big problem. I mean, there's a whole negotiation that happens just to get your parents to let you take part in this. Um, so there's two answers to that. In terms of internal validity, we you know we're randomizing across all the girls who were given consent to take part in this program, right? Because they'll all be using, having the same period of time within the thing. And so then there's an equal distribution of those types of girls, the more empowered, less empowered girls. In terms of external validity, it's more difficult because you're right, we're not getting the most challenging. And so one thing we may want to think about, actually, it's a good point, one thing we may want to think about is just other ways of incentivizing the parents to let the girls take part in this so that it's not being, so that there's no so much selection on which are the more enlightened parents or which are the more, you know, so we're still getting some of the more fragile or difficult girl, uh, situations. I think that would be, that would be good. In the pilot, what are the rates of refusal? I mean, everyone took part, right? There was Everyone's one girl who couldn't, and then after she saw everybody come the first day, she went home with a note and came back. Yeah, the other thing is there's sandwiches. And so, so we're feeding them, so it's kind of, you know, it's not that long. So that's sort of the hope. Six days. Six days in a row, one week. No. Um, we'll we'll talk through. Yeah. So no, I yeah. Continue. Why did you decide to organize within schools rather than across schools? Mm -hmm. So that would be a lot of schools. Yeah. I <laughs> well, so I told so. you totally magic practicality, but I imagine you were also worried about oh spillovers right, for spillovers. sure, hugely. <laughs> so it was a very big decision, and and and. And so, yeah, so on the practicality side, you know, we have to have such good relationships with these schools for them to let us stay there for so long and be with the girls and everything. The spillovers issue, basically through the pilots, we, we saw that although they certainly talk to each other about what they're learning, it's pretty hard to actually teach. So you may get more spillovers in terms of information, but the negotiation skills are pretty hard to teach by just telling someone about them. So what you could say is you should stand up for yourself. But that's, I mean, I think that's exactly our point. The message you should stand up for yourself can go only so far. But you need to learn these particular communication skills. We're going to be doing um, a lot of document, you know, through all of these surveys, we're going to try to really understand what pieces of information are spreading, what everyone's learning. So we'll have the information on the control group as well, and then they'll will know if they learned particular no, things. But I totally take your point that you're saying teaching negotiation has to happen experientially. That's right. That's the whole point. Right, exactly. And so therefore, I'm actually, you might be less concerned about yeah. spillovers than in some other Exactly, designs. exactly. I mean, I, you know, I think in this design, we've sort of stacked everything against ourselves in a way because it's just the very, like, marginal impact of the experience of negotiation because, you know, you have everything else. You have the mentors, you have the young women who are the coaches that are in front of you, you have the games, you have the social capital, you have information, everything else is, like, stacked there. Um, but I think given that there's so little sort of, you know, evidence on the power of negotiation, that's the only way we can really do it. and, and um, from the pilots, it looks like there's there's some stuff happening. So maybe I can talk about that, and we'll you know we'll see what what we find. But um, um, so this is sort of the process we went through. That we spent you know this, this time initially just doing a lot of focus groups with different age groups to really understand the the problem, mm -hmm. and then piloting. Um, so the very first pilot was um, in December 2010 of the curriculum, and as Kathleen said, we sort of took all these other youth curriculums and sort of were trying to think how well they would work. We also got a bunch of community HIV educators who work with grassroots soccer to go out and test this, and they were being trained in it and just say like how, how much this is relevant. And we completely revamped the curriculum. And then in July 2011, we were all there, and Kathleen came, it was really great. And we did, you know, there was two uh, groups there was an information group and a negotiation group, but that's where we had like the, the remedial group and the first group. So you know we can't learn anything from that other than just again testing the curriculum, and that was 38 participants. And then in October 2011, um, we then you know did a, another testing of the of the kind of more refined negotiation curriculum because one of the biggest things we learned here is that. Um, a lot of the, again, it was just this constant process of like, even just now, even after this October 2011, the biggest question was, they can't, asking about the underlying interest is very difficult, because that seems like you're being very disrespectful. So now what do you do? You know, so there's things like that that kept arising 
that made us realize that you know we need to learn how to teach this differently to make sure all the case studies, all the examples, all the exercises are very relevant to their life, etc. Um, and then that that session it was um, taught by our local coaches, so that was very helpful too because one of our biggest questions is like, can you know if we're not there, can this be taught um, well? Mm -hmm. And, um, and this is actually one of our local coaches, Nomsa. And let me just see if we can get her. Oh, you can't hear it. OK. Um, well, so she's, <laughs> she's getting them to, so this was like one of our very first things. She was just getting them to talk about, she, you know, it was a call and response, which is something that's very used in African pedagogy. But, um, but again, it, it was kind of not sufficient for really incorporating these skills. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the curriculum, and then I just want to, um, I'm about to tell you then all about the qualitative feedback, but before I do that, I really want to acknowledge um, Tomoko's presence here, because Tomoko Hariaga is a PhD student who joined us, thanks to WAP's support actually, joined us um, for all of January in Zambia, and was like an incredible powerhouse. She's had probably more experience than I have in running field experiments, and um, was there and helped us so much with, she did all the qualitative um, interviews with the girls and the parents, which you'll see the results from, from those pilots that I talked about, both from the July pilot and the October pilot, and learned what were the kind of behavioral changes that were occurring, and then helped us to develop the indicators um, that we'll tell you about. And so we're grateful to WAP for supporting her and grateful to Tamako, and thanks very much for being here as well. Um, and so, so basically, the, let me just tell you about sort of what we cover in the six-day information curriculum. Then we'll tell you about the feedback from the pilots and then the indicators. So on the, on the information curriculum, the first day is what does it mean to be a girl in, in Zambia? What are the benefits and challenges? What are the role models? The second day is focused on returns to schooling and the benefits of staying in school to your family and to your career, you know, we uncovered pieces of information. You know, there, there's some evidence that precise information about returns to schooling can make a difference, especially for boys. <laughs> um, but here, so we talk about some returns to schooling, particularly actually for bride price in Zambia is higher if you're more educated, mm -hmm. things like that. So we tell them about that. Then we talk about in the third day, the barriers to staying in school, especially, you know, when do you need to talk to your parents about the barriers, et cetera. And we tell them about scholarship opportunities. So there's lots of NGOs with scholarship opportunities. So we tell them about those. We even show them the forms and say, like, you know, how they can fill them out. Again, information, but without the relational skills that might be needed to take advantage of that information, but important information that they may not have. Um, and then um, the fourth and fifth day are about HIV information and prevention. So the first day is like the basic, broad HIV information. And the fifth day is, is really that the sugar daddy's precise information using that same curriculum to talk about relative risks. And then the six days gets in review. So for the negotiation, we do exactly that. Plus, um, we link it with how to apply this using negotiation skills. So the first day is uh, negotiation. And let me say that um, we, this was again like a, this was the final basically iteration of the curriculum. And what we developed is, is, um, is this idea that basically, and those of you who are familiar with negotiation will recognize this immediately, but basically, but we, then we created hand movements for it too. And so it's the idea that, you know, um, when you are at, at a point of positions and you're, you're bargaining over positions, there's very little you can do. It's just distributive. And, and essentially, it's just who has the power. The only thing you can decide um, in that situation, if you're just positions, is whether to walk away at that point or not. Um, and you know these girls, as we mentioned, have very little power, so this is not a great place for them to be. Um, but uh, what you can do is uncover the interests underneath the positions. So the very first step is me. So you have to uncover your own interests and just think, what is underneath my position? What are the various interests underneath my position? And then the second step is you. What are the interests under your position? Um, and, and really understanding those. And then the third step is the shared interests. It's, it's together. So where are the shared interests? And also brainstorming. How do we bring the various interests that we don't have together? And then the fourth step is build. Uh, and so it's the me, you, together, build. Uh, and <laughs> it, it, it works really well. Um, and, and so again, this sort of like understand your own interests, know the other option. 
Um, under the U, as I said, the difficult thing was, what are all those interests? Because we were getting them to ask questions. Well, why do you want to do that? Why is that work? And that was not working. Like, people just were not answering those questions. For example, uh, this actually one of our coaches gave an example of her older brother who had given all this money um, for tuition payments, but not enough money. And so they wanted to ask, well, why didn't you give the rest of the money? But what that did is like threaten his identity as a generous yeah. person. And so, you know, but, but we talked with them about, you know, facts, emotions, identity. They were, they, they were like, well, how do we teach that to girls? And so what we said is you actually have to appreciate the person for what they're contributing. And so that's the find the good, you know, um, and choose your approach to, to asking them about their interest and then discover their interests. Uh, and then identify shared interests, recognize roadblocks, and then look for trades, which in, it's very difficult here to sort of have the right balance between um, finding similarities and not getting like defensive about differences, but recognizing that differences can be a source of value creation. So trying to really get that. And then brainstorming creative solutions, complete building checklists, and decide what really matters. Take five is something that turned out to be really, really powerful for them. And we, didn't, we only rec recognized this in the second pilot. So basically, um, it was just, you know, take five, go to the balcony, you know, whatever it is that gives you some emotional distance, it's emotional regulation. But it helped very much in the, in the process of being able to um, uh, carry out these steps. And so this was, again, this is all from Tomoko. So these were the focus group discussions and one-on-one -on -one interviews, 16 girls from the July 2011 session and six girls from October uh, 2011. And here are some of the things that they mentioned. Um, and jump in, Tomoko, if there's anything else that. So the, the, the social impacts were you know, improved control of emotion, increased realization of alternatives, increased advice giving, and more walking away. So uh, there were a lot of girls who said that my parents th say that I can think now, that I'm not throwing t like temper tantrums, that I, I actually can, can think through stuff. And then you know, if I didn't have the training, I would have said to my mom, you don't love me enough, I'm going to go sleep in my aunt's place. But instead, I talked to her about why I wanted to and how to. OK, and then at school, before even when I knew the answer, I was quiet. My friends laughed at me. Now I think it's good to be open. Several girls talked about their participation in the classroom. Um, and then, you know, one girl talked about actually going and getting a tutor. One girl talked about saving a small amount to buy books. Um, several talked about being able to trade for scores so they could study. So um, we had done an exercise around trading for, for chores. So, that's, so one thing we learned was that whatever exercises we give them are the ones in which they do implement in their lives. So we need to make sure we're giving them lots of good exercises that are really the ones. And it's a little tricky because we can't really give them an exercise about condom negotiation with their boyfriends because that would be not good for their families. So we have to do something that's similar to that, but similar enough that they will then be able to apply um, and feeling less shy in class. So, and did you design this um, the case that then negotiated yourself, or how? how yeah. Tell more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so credit goes to lots and lots of places. So we did start with um, Jared Kerhan's program for young negotiators, and it has adapted lots of the standard negotiation exercises for youth. Um, we worked a lot with the Mercy Corps. Um, they have a conflict and negotiation curriculum, and our initial run was through that. Um, we quickly started adapting those. Corinne is brilliant. Um, so basically the process was and continues to be, if you go to the classroom, you do it for a day, you come back, oh, you spend an hour or two afterwards with the coaches, what worked, what didn't work, mm -hmm. come back, you adapt for the next day. That was the first round. Um, the coaches themselves afterwards, we spent two days with the coach, two days, with the coaches going through every single day and saying what worked, what didn't work. So at this point, the curriculum is reminiscent of um, the curricula that we started with, um, but each single exercise has been adapted and readapted and readapted um, to sort of like your paper when it finally gets published. <laughs> you know, the ideas for the same ideas that we started with for the paper is a totally different paper. Mm -hmm. That's sort of where the curriculum is. It's all, it's every single word of it um, Corinne has written. Um, including this breakthrough of me you together build that came when you were in the last when they did their last round i wasn't there so but i actually think that it was from you like we were one moment where where they were the girls were saying the coaches were saying we're having a problem with people asking because it used to be a a b b yeah. aware ask brainstorm build and the ask was like a big issue 
And, and then, so as we were talking about that, Corinne said, I remember Kathleen said we should do me, you, together, build. So I don't know if you remember that or not, but, uh, but then we were like, yes. And then, then we made the hand movements. And, uh, and then it was just all in there. Now I came up and showed, I'm like, those are great. And so it's, it's, this has been an evolution. But um, Corinne's been doing all the writing, but the coaches have really, um, their insights into what's working with the girls. It's like really them. They gave the so many cases and examples and everything. But we're hoping that it's going to be it's the kind of examples that are everywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, that's certainly, and for a lot of girls in other places as well. So hoping it'll be really relevant. And we have a copy of the curriculum, so if people are interested in looking at that. Yeah. So one of my questions is, in terms of the qualitative feedback, did you find that in addition to these clear benefits of how the girls are perceived, how they perceive themselves, their ability to feel control over their emotions, were there unintended negative consequences? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there was anything negative that came out of it. It's not, it, there are things that they couldn't really apply in their lives. They mm -hmm. understood a lot of the ideas. Um, one thing that came out of it was that negotiating with parents or using the skills to mm. talk to parents is, is much, much more difficult and you know, very, very few girls actually tried that as opposed to just giving advice to friends and you know, negotiating mm. with your sisters or chores and things like that. But there was nothing that, you know, the, the girls were really like, inspired in like, the program. Mm -hmm. They wanted to like, you know, talk to their friends I think that it's partly because we're, we're still looking for that, you know, also in the pilot. That's why we're asking actually in the, in the surveys, we're asking about the allocation towards the other siblings. Like what if right. they're taking away from the other siblings right. in a way, you know? Exactly. So that's one thing we're going to look at. And then, um, and then, you know, the perceptions of the parents about their, do of the, their daughters, you know, if they thought they're being more um, unruly. Right. then maybe they would take something else away from them, right. you know, so... Or would they be perceived as cunning, you know, disrupt social... Exactly, exactly. And so that, I mean, I think we erred, like, maybe too much even on the side of that, because then the girls were just all about, like, negotiation is being nice, you know, and so we, because we were so scared of, yeah. of exactly that. But I think was, we're going to try to get... Uh, let, me, let me, maybe I'll talk about the in outcome indicators and make sure that we can try to get that, yeah. yeah I was just going to say that um, I spent, like, a year living and working in a slum in India, and in the process of doing that, there was three girls that worked at this women's cooperative that were 16 to 18 that I got really close to, and they had all dropped out of school, and so we were trying to, you know, I just developed really close relationships with all three of them, we were trying to get them to go to a specific school that, like, that helped, uh, that provided, like, a half-day tuition for girls mm -hmm. that had dropped out to go back in, and, um, in my process over the year of working with one of the girls, you know, the girl worked at the women's cooperative, and her mom did as well. Um, and so I would, you know, I had all sorts of time to talk to Valna, which was the, the girl. And at a certain point, when we were just talking about whether she was interested in this or not, she said, you know, I think I, I talked to my mom, and she can't. They, they're just saying no. And I was like, well, I, I also talk to your mom every day. And, she, and then she suggested that I talk to her mom herself. And so I talked to her mom, and then, um, like a week and a half after I talked to her mom, her older sister, who also came in and out of that cooperative, told me sometime during that week, my mom's father had really, really hit her. And mm -hmm. I think it was, and, and Kanta then, who's found his mom, I had known for an entire year. I mean, I had, I, I lived in the slum, so I had mm -hmm. gone to their home. Like, so there's definitely, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a, something that will stay with me always. But I think, you know, and, and I also would have never known that, and I don't think a surveyor would have ever known that either. Right. Donna's sister was really close to me, so she, she told me that. But I think there's lots of things that we yeah. don't even imagine. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I think that's, I'm really, um, thank you for, for sharing that. I think that um, one thing that, you know, it has been difficult for us to think is like, is it worth doing another sibling survey, you know, along with the parents? But I think we really so need the full story, even if, you know, and, and trying to find ways for people to feel comfortable to tell us the full story, I think is going to be, um, yeah, really important. Yeah. Yeah. 
about Yeah, yeah. So um, we've been uh, consulting with the Ministry of Education along each step of this and also with all the, t the teachers in the pilot school a lot so that we can make sure that there's, for example, certain rules about uh, not talking about certain aspects of sexual relationships um, at, before a certain age. So we've made sure to, to make sure to not, not be doing that. Um, there is in the works a curriculum actually that the Ministry of Education is wanting to roll out on HIV negotiation, et cetera, but they haven't really worked on it so much. So this is sort of in line with that. Um, I think that's incredibly important because having the parent support for this is going to be really critical. It's also going to be important, I mean, in terms of getting their consent, that they know what's covered in there. But that's why I think the information, we wanted to make sure that, you know, there was no information about, for example, sexual relationships, HIV, et cetera, that was not in also the information curriculum that wasn't in the negotiation curriculum, so that they know, we can say, your daughter may learn about X and Y and Z, so that they know what the, what, what might be occurring. The other, so, so Nava mentioned, the other thing that um, we did is we met with all the teachers from the school and some regional teachers, and they gave us the curriculum that all of their HIV curriculum. So I believe we're not saying anything in the information treatment that's not in the information that's not about HIV that's not in the HIV curriculum. Because there's information about staying in school, that's information that they wouldn't necessarily get at school, like how to get scholarships and things like that. But the HIV curriculum, we didn't go past what is in the um, ministries of, Ministry of Education's um, okay curriculum that's already in the schools. Um, so just to quickly go over the the outcome indicators and what we think the direction what we think is actually might be happening because all of these quotes and everything these were you know these we don't know if that was because of the negotiation or because of the information or because they just saw some mentors and they felt empowered period and you know so um, we hypothesize that the intervention happens and the girls feel this increased self-efficacy. So they have an ability to advocate for themselves and they can effectively communicate relevant information and they can recognize these opportunities for win-win. And that would lead to different types of interactions than they've had before. So the conversations instead of one-sided ultimatums about not feeling loved and, and wanting to go away, self-advocacy instead of whining and an atmosphere of joint problem solving over confrontation. Um, and then the hypothesis is that this would lead to different outcomes, um, that there would be more resources devoted to girls where it's efficient, uh, like school fees. Again, one of the things we want to figure out is whether this is coming at the expense of another sibling's um, school fees, for example. Better ability to protect oneself from HIV. One thing I didn't mention from the, the qualitative work that Tomoko did was, was that one girl talked about breaking up with her boyfriend, one girl talked about telling another girl to break up with her boyfriend. There was a lot of talk about abstinence, basically. So there, there was some aspect of that uh, that happened, and, and so the question is be able to measure that. Collaboration where possible with teachers and friends. And then, you know, better mental health, decreased feelings of being silenced or hopeless, increased locus of control. So these are all kind of um, some of the empowerment measures that others have used for young girls. Um, expansion of goals for the future. And the way that we're going to be measuring them is um, through the surveys, as I mentioned, which would be um, with the girls, the parents, and hopefully the other siblings. We want to do some experiments with them halfway through, maybe two or three weeks after they've done the negotiation training, because we want to see if they've learned the skills. So not just the information, not just the self-reported behavior, but actually have they learned particular skills. Um, and then also the institutional data from the schools. So on, from the survey data, you know, we can get a lot of the the overall self-perception, the outcomes of arguments. We can ask the teachers for observations about the girls uh, participating in school. And then the sort of self-reported health um, outcomes, both mental health and reproductive health. Um, and then from the institutional, as I was mentioning, the attendance and dropout payment of school fees, school performance. Um, STI incidents, pregnancy, and age of sexual debate would, would still come from the survey, but they would be more behavioral measures. And then um, we, we'd love to actually get your thoughts on what other types of experimental measures we could use. So one idea we've had, um, these are all things, is that um, we would have them come to um, a kind of lab in a couple weeks after them, and, and uh, all the girls from all the different treatments, and uh, maybe boys too. Um, and we could look and see if how well they negotiate in just a kind of lab experiment. 
And or we could also do something where we offer, the teachers actually can you know, send a flyer home with all the students in their class that offers a tutoring opportunity. So either we could do it just for the girls or also the girls and boys. Your daughter has the opportunity to participate in tutoring for her end of term exams at a special price, taught by university graduates on site at your daughter's school. And, and so we would see whether the girls in the negotiation training were better able to convince their parents to take advantage of this. So it's somewhat costly, so the parents would have to pay for it. And the hypothesis would be that the girls may not may be better able to do that. Now, that relies a bit on the idea that this is something that's more in line with the girls' preferences than it is with the parents. Um, and so one way to test that would be to sort of um, use this survey and other measures to predict what preferences the parents versus the girls have. So for example, when we're compensating them for taking part in the survey, we can ask them how they want to get their compensation, whether they want to get it in something that's school oriented for the girl, for example. Like maybe these girls don't want ring. Maybe they want, you know, this to be really stereotypical, like a pretty cell phone, um, which some girls have talked about. And so you can offer different com compensation, different forms to elicit the girls' preferences. Um, and then also in the same for the parents to elicit the, the parents' preferences towards schooling versus an outcome that would just be for themselves, like a gift certificate that would the mother could just use or the father could just use. Um, just because somebody may have really great negotiation skills, but if they want a cell phone and not a tutoring opportunity, then they're not going to we're not going to see a take up of this, even if the girl has great negotiation skills. Uh, similarly, if the parents want something that the girls don't want, we would see a take up even if the girls haven't learned any negotiation skills. Yeah. Um, just a question. Through your qualitative discussions, did you find that the power dynamics that take place between uh, the girls and their parents is the same or different than that that exists between the girls and these older men? Because this uh, experiment would be great at helping to figure out how they can, if they've actually learned at dealing with that parent uh, dynamic, but not necessarily with the other case, unless it, they do have sort of similar approaches to yeah. both of them. I mean, I, I think one one element is about the so there's there's the power dynamic which is clear. There's a power asymmetry in both cases. There's the resource um, who holds the resources. So a lot of what um, girls transact with older men about is about school fees, books, cell phones, actually, and um, clothes. And so in that way, it would be similar. I don't know, Tomoko, did they ever talk about older men or? Yeah. yeah. I've actually had a related, I had a related question. Um, because I think, but think about that too, and mm -hmm. then I, I have to, don't have an answer. Um, but you know, how transferable are these negotiation skills? That yeah. is something, of course, that we always wonder in our totally. classes as well. And so, the, uh, the specific question I had was: Are these same-sex or mixed-sex schools? Mixed sex schools. Mixed sex schools. So already by selecting girls, it feels For like sure. it's a women's thing. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and therefore, it's gendered in that yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And they practice with other girls, you know? Right. And then they have to go out and practice with the guys. boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the qualitative example, and even in the example which you talked about from the slums of India, all the dialogue is taking place female to female. She talked about saying to her mother versus going to her aunts, mm -hmm. that the dialogue and the relational negotiation yeah. still take place within a female context. And I think that, that that's a really different model for most girls who probably are not usually negotiating with their fathers. They negotiate with their mother. Their mother negotiates with mm -hmm. the father. But there's an additional layer. If we were looking at this as a game, there's an additional mm -hmm. layer in the game. And how do you help girls who in essence would need to translate the skill to the mother mm. to change the household dynamic. And I think the one other piece, and I have no answer, yeah. but in terms of the relationship with the older man, the one way it differs, you're totally, in my view, accurate on mm. how it's similar. The one way it differs is the older man, from, from my perspective of how this plays out in Sub-Saharan Africa and the sugar daddy phenomenon and so forth, the older man has a transactional interest. Mm -hmm. Whereas the parent has a long-term investment where the girl's capacity over time may impact. Right. Completely. And, and the older man doesn't have that. Completely. So one, so then like, yeah. It, it, that's also a challenge. You know, one way we've gotten at that, and 
Kate's also been very involved in developing the curriculum, so I'm looking at her because maybe we can figure out a way to mm. highlight this without, you know, getting a little sensitive. But is that, you know, what when we say like, here's the position you need to know when you're walk when you need to walk away, mm. when you understand their interests and you understand what his interests in you are, mm. versus in, you know, mm -hmm. your parents' interest in you, you recognize that there's no shared interests and you walk away. Mm -hmm. You know, so we we actually mention that in a part of it. Nice. There is, there is even a, a, a game, one of the early scenarios, the solution is, is essentially to walk away mm -hmm. around that, dealing with an older man in a market. Mm -hmm. He wants you to, yeah, she, mm -hmm. she wants a better price for a dress, he wants something else. And this is a high bar, but we have lots of examples in historical context of girls being able to gain information that the older generation wouldn't be able to gain where the girl's the translator mm. and then there's gains. We have that in terms of language, we have that right. in immigrant situations. Right. So Completely. that's a possible thing to do. Yeah. It's hard to measure. Co yes, we should add that to the survey and figure out. Well, I mean, because, for example, like maybe one thing we can add to the survey is about um, the mother's ideas about returns to schooling, for example. You know, um, and whether those particular pieces of information got passed on to the mother. Yeah. Because we have actually like a role play where the mother's saying, I can't send you to school, like, who's gonna take care of all these kids? Mm -hmm. And then she has all these arguments like, well, who's gonna marry me if I'm not educated? You know, are you just gonna marry me to some, you know? And so then it's like basically dealing with the mother's interests right. based on that. And then we can see how well that translates, mm -hmm. yeah. But is it the mother that actually makes the decision in the household about things like education? Because if it's, if it's not, then just having the mother's perceptions on the returns to education isn't necessary. Right. Enough. She may re recognize the value in it, but if she doesn't have the power to negotiate that yeah. with right. the father, then the child then might So, them. you know, it's interesting because it's a bit... It's a bit subtle in Zambia about the power relationships between the husband and the wife and who holds the resources and stuff. So it's not as um, clear cut about, <laughs> about uh, like who holds the purse um, stuff. So, so there are opportunities for the mother to influence um, where the money goes. Not always, so I think it would be important to also elicit the father's you know, ideas and preferences. Oh, completely, they yeah. The experience shows that even within one community, families just are, have different kind of wills about how much they're willing to deviate. And For the sure. Those that are in the harder families just have it so much harder. Yeah. Actually, one, one really, so one thing is that we don't, we don't lose those girls in a way that, you know, you were saying that they're, they're actually able to select into the program as well. But you're right, like, it's like can, maybe they can't ever use the skills. So um, we're trying to get the right survey measures so that we can have, be able to identify heterogeneous treatment effects of the kind that you're saying. Just one absolutely qualitative note on that. I'm not gonna talk about the two, what we thought were gonna be two treatments the morning, the afternoon, we were going to do information negotiation, but it turned out that the very first day when we were dealing with the afternoon group, we just like it was totally different. And so we talked to the teachers, and through this whole process, we found out why it was. So we just put everybody into negotiation treatment because we didn't, it didn't make any sense to have two treatments, and we really needed to test the negotiation curriculum. At the end of the, of the training, all of the coaches and, and Corinne and I all agreed that the afternoon class was better. I mean, they had, they had leaped over the morning class. You know, there's individuals, so you know everybody. It's real. You know, you have your favorite girls and things like that. But but in the end, the afternoon class really caught on in a way that stunned us. We were just wow. So we had we had in essence kind of given up on them and said, well, we'll just use the curriculum. Um, but so so I'm sure that there's going to be an interaction with the um, absolute skill level of the girls. Um, but we were very happy to see that it wasn't just the you know, sort of girls who've been able to negotiate their way into passing the test. Mm -hmm. We're not mm -hmm. sure that the test is an ability test as much as a, mm -hmm. getting yourself there test. Yeah. 
um, I don't know. Did you want to? Read? No, that's it. That's it. So this is the time for discussion. I think we can I mean, I, I just put this up and see. Um, I mean, it, it's great. <laughs> it's a wonderful study. Um, and I imagine what you would most benefit from at this point is to help you brainstorm about mm. what dependent variables yeah, exactly. could you be measuring. Exactly. And, and if there's um, any treatment issues that you see as well. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I think, I think you're, I mean, there, you know, I mean, you, you have the, the spillovers, right? And mm -hmm. about that again. Yeah. But the, I was actually uh, reminded of your other study now. <laughs> I mean, another, another thing could take up in, in health plan. Yeah. So that could be, I mean, I think the more behavioral measures yeah. um, you could have, and the more, of course, I mean, the preference, that's, of course, crucial that you have that preference distinction yeah. between. Yeah, but they're the, so young. So you're thinking, like, take up a other, contraception. No, no, not even contraception, but, you know, something else that would be good for the health. I mean, a checkup. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a yeah, checkup yeah. or something like that. It wouldn't have to be contraception, but something that's actually good for the health. That's interesting. To get. So maybe, like, a voucher to go and talk that's to a exactly nurse? Right. That's exactly right. And, and I'm not even thinking necessarily contraception. That's really interesting. Interesting, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Really yeah. Um, so we'd have to do it in a way that would get at um, that the parents wouldn't be scared that the nurse is going to give like this girl uh, uh -huh. pills or something, you know. And that's parents are worried about that. Uh -huh. Yeah, a lot. They get um, everybody at school. Yeah. Not just girls. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit tricky. You could uh, embed it in a, could be embedded in like nutrition curriculum or something. I yeah. mean, you could make it. There's no reason that that effect wouldn't be caught if it was specifically non contraception. Yeah, that it's like just basically investment in health yeah, in a way. Not that might not trust that. Exactly, that. exactly. But yeah, maybe we if we can think of something that would be investment in health, that wouldn't be family planning related. Right. Um, so it's clear because what because like about. you know. At grade 10, I think that that would be okay. Grade 11, you know, still be right. problematic, but it would be okay. This age is really, really sensitive. Um, but some kind of investment in health, in the health of the child, I think, would be. Again, it's the long-term interests, mm -hmm. and you know. Um, they really are still little girls. I mean, these. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, they're little girls. Yeah. Yeah. So any other, so Iris hit it exactly, but we would love input on is our outcome measures anywhere along the chain that mm. So, so I think there's, there's two stages to this. So while we're in the experimental stage where we're really trying to see the difference between these treatments, we don't want to do anything universal to train everybody in negotiation skills, for example, or to intervene in the families because we want to make sure that the effect is coming from our treatments. Mm -hmm. If it turns out that we get our findings, um, and interestingly, you know, if, if the information treatment makes a big difference, that matters a lot too. Um, because that can be replicated. Um, if the information and negotiation treatment matters a lot, at the point where the Ministry of Education takes this over, we can talk with them about broader community interventions as well. Well, we've had such a wonderful conversation. Naisha kindly drew my attention to the fact that it's actually after one of them. I feel like we could continue our discussion. I wanted to thank Kathleen again so much for joining us today and sharing these findings, and Nava Ashraf for coming and joining, having just returned from Zambia. A really fascinating conversation, and what a wonderful example of a replicable intervention and trying to identify that piece that can be used. And next week, at this time, we'll have Maya Sen, who's a PhD student from the government department, will be speaking about like judge, like daughter looking at the effects of judges voting on women's issues who have daughters. Mm -hmm. So, an interesting. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and we have our seminar um, calendar at the end of the table for the entire semester. All of our sessions are recorded and will be up on the web, and we thank you for joining us today. Just one, one more little, so um, Kate has handed each of you 
a flyer about this. Um, you will notice on the back, there's a budget on the back. Um, we are, to move forward, um, we need funding. So any of you who have good friends who are philanthropists <laughs> and care about women, um, we would love to talk with them. We're happy to um, talk with whomever you think might be interested in the study. <laughs> And will you be here for a couple of minutes if people have Absolutely. other thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we'll we would there. also like your thoughts on the, on the design. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's life. <laughs> Thank you.